Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again with my weekly vlog update. Um, I've got a ton of information to pack into this week's uh, update, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. And as always, if there are topics that I talk about that I feel are interesting enough or complex enough where they deserve their own clip, I'll do that. A couple of these are absolutely clips that you'll see coming this week. They may actually post before the vlog, depending on how the editing goes. The first thing I want to talk about is a brand new product in the market called the Hover Camera. And if you haven't seen this yet, it'll blow your mind. It is an incredibly cool product that really defies a category at this point. It's kind of a combination of the best of drones with the best of cameras. And it's built for the novice that doesn't want to learn about flying drones or any of that kind of stuff, um, but just wants to be able to take a selfie without using one of those long selfie sticks to extend their camera out. And es essentially what this thing is, is it looks like a small hardcover book that the bottom part of it unflaps like this, and you've got two wings that pop up that have blades inside them that are sort of encased in this carbon fiber protection, so you can't cut your fingers with them. But all you do to power the thing up is power it up, flip out those two blades, and then let it go. And it'll actually hover right in front of you, and it can take fantastic pictures and video, and you can control it with your smartphone. So if you're with a group of friends, like if we're sitting around this table, I could let it go and launch it, and then with my, with my cell phone, actually float it back up 10 or 15 feet away from me and capture the perfect picture at that table, or even video of something we're doing. So I really, really think this product is creative and innovative. You know, again, I talk about Martian technology a lot. It's almost like aliens have come down and handed them this product to build because to me, it's a category breaking product or busting product where I can't really call it a drone and it really isn't a selfie cam. It, again, it's the best combination of both of those two worlds. Now, what I find really exciting about this is that the technology we've become accustomed to as part of this hobby is starting to make its way into other products. And I think I think, unfortunately or fortunately, this category of a flying selfie camera is something you're going to see a lot of companies coming out with. So this may be the first one and, and certainly the coolest one that I've seen. Um, but, you know, kind of keep your eye on that category. It's not the cheapest product out of the gate. Now, it's the first one they're making. It's the first one in the market space. So it's a little pricier than I expected. I'm sure that price will come down a little bit. But if you're like me and have a fetish for technology, um, this is a product I have to own just based on the cool factor. Because I can't imagine being at a party, opening up those two wings, letting the thing float away from me, the reaction the crowd's going to have to that. Not to mention the great pictures you can get with that without having the, the hassle of having to fire up a drone and all the noise and everything else that that involves. So anyway, check that out. There's a link below to see that. The only product I want to talk about this week um, that I have involvement in is the um, is the Arc Tech products. We constantly get updates from these guys. They're always looking to improve the products they've got in the market space already and look for other places that they can actually introduce products. So we have conversations with them on a regular basis, sort of feedback from you guys and what you'd like to see, my personal experience with what I fly. And one of the questions I get an awful lot is, why are you not doing more for other brands of, of copters? Why are you doing a lot for DJI but not really doing a lot for the other companies? So they've embarked on this new project for uh, the unique product line. So if you own a unique Typhoon H, um, they've released these high gain antennas, 7 dBi gain antennas, that actually replace the two antennas that are on your unique controller. Now those antennas are pretty good that are on there, but these actually have a gain built into them which will give you much more distance than the stock antennas on the controller. The best part about this for me is these are not primarily directional antennas, they're omnidirectional, which means the minute I put them on, I can do all the stunts I'm used to now, flying around myself, flying behind me, flying in front of me, and I get the additional gain of this. Now, two things it'll do for you is it'll increase your range, which is probably important to you if you want to fly further than you're flying today. But the other thing that I like a lot about these range extender kits is I don't fly very, very far because line of sight is only so far and I'm getting a little old. So if it's three or 4,000 feet out there and it's a bright day and I've got a white drone in the sky, it's hard for me to keep track of it. But what I like about these is they give me really, really strong responsiveness close in. So if I'm in an area where there's a lot of noise and stuff, this helps me override a lot of those noise uh, generators that would have caused me problems with the stock antenna. So if you're a unique Typhoon H flyer, these might be something you want to look into. They're not that expensive because, again, you're just buying the antennas. You're not buying the whole mounting kit. So we'll have a link below for those as well to our website if you're interested in those. The third thing I want to talk about is a bit of a controversial topic, but I think it's super critical for us to pay attention to. And it doesn't even really relate to the United States or the FAA or drones in the country. It's the regulation changes that are taking place or proposed changes that are taking place in Europe right now. So there's this uh, European agency, EASA, which are sort of the equivalent of the FAA, but they've got a bunch of intermingled agencies that all have kind of responsibility for the national airspace, the safety of the national airspace. But this EASA organization has kind of stepped in the middle of this debate, especially around drones. And they've put out a proposed regulation, a prototype regulation, they call it, which is our term is proposed, um, which has what they expect to be the final rules and regulations for drones being flown in the UK. 
and just reading through it, it scares the bejesus out of me because it's a very, I'm going to use the word draconian because I use that a lot and I, I believe it applies here. It's a very draconian law that they're proposing, which really limits, um, severely limits where you can fly, what kind of drone you can fly, how qualified you have to be. So, you know, I get a lot of people complaining about what the FAA is doing with the Part 107 regulations. This is like that times 10. Um, just some of the things that scared me out of the gate is they're, uh, over, overall, they're going to create three categories. There's going to be open, specific, and certified. The open category is pretty much anybody can fly in that, and any drone you fly in that, you don't need regulation approval, you don't need a license, anything like that, but there's severe limitations. It can only fly 50 feet up, and I think it's f 50 meters up and 500 meters away from you, so it's a very, very small drone. Most of the drones we fly, especially the the unique, the DJI and you know the, the uh, GoPro products would fall into the category of specific. Now inside that specific category, they have a bunch of different grades of drones, all the way from A0 to A3. And I'm going to do a clip on this, and I'm actually going to do a dial-up uh, conversation with another channel that I'm friends with, who's in the UK that has a better understanding of this than I do. Um, but those regulations, that that specific category, those four regulations determine uh, what type of drone you can fly. And as you get up closer to the A3 category. There may be certifications that you have to have and pilot's tests you have to have and you have to put safety uh, proposals together to get approval. So it's going to be very, very hard for the average drone flyer over there to actually just for fun put up a drone and not have to worry about these regulations. The scariest part for me, I think, is if this becomes law in Europe, even though in the States you know, we have our own laws and, and a lot of people are very nationalistic and say, oh, what do we care what's going on over in Europe or in Australia or wherever? We're all in this together. You know, we really we need to bond behind our brothers and sisters over there in Europe to sort of support some sanity around this law. And I've got a link below with an email address that, and, and I've got links to the two documents that sort of outline what this is about. <clears throat> They're complicated documents, and there's hundreds of pages of, of legal jargon in there. But the gist of it really is dangerous, I think, for the drone hobby in general. And again, the reasons I think it's important to support them, just because we're good guys anyway, and they're they're fellow hobbyists, so we'd want to support them based on that. But as is important as that, is that a lot of times when these laws get passed, other countries then look at that as sort of a thumbnail view of what's appropriate. So if this goes through the way it's proposed, that's going to have all kinds of ramifications, I believe, on the regulations in the United States and certainly for other countries that haven't set up regulations yet. Because the U.S. and Europe, Australia, a lot of other large companies, China, our, our countries are viewed as sort of leaders in the space. And a lot of the other countries will look to them first to let them have the fist fights over what's appropriate. Once the law becomes the law, other countries will look at that as a standard they'll use in their country. So I think this is a dangerous step back backwards for drones. The other reason I think it's super important for us to support our friends in Europe is that drone manufacturers' pricing is based on how many units they sell. So if all of a sudden the rules and regulations in Europe change to the point where most people go, you know what, I wanted to fly a drone, I have no interest in it now because it's such a burdensome process to get approved, they're not going to sell as many drones, which means, again, selfishly, from a cheapskate perspective, my drone's going to cost me more because they're not selling another 500,000 drones in Europe so that production cost goes up, which means my drones are going to be more expensive. So the two things that scare me about this, outside of the fact that it's a terribly bad thing for my friends in Europe, is that it will impact the U.S., I think, from a regulatory perspective, which means either they'll curtail some of our rules or some of the things they're looking to loosen won't happen. So we have to absolutely support a revision of this that takes out some of those um, those sharper teeth, if you will, in that regulation, which again, I can't understand how you would have that level of regulation around something that, as long as you fly it responsibly and you put the kind of rules we have in place in the States as part of Part 107 into play, that should be enough. I mean, we're responsible adults flying these things for the most part. If you break the rules, you got to suffer the consequences, but give me some reasonable rules to fly by. So anyway, that, that's the two cents on that. But please, if you get a chance to read them, read them. If you don't, at least send an email to that link below to say, I don't agree with these proposed regulations. Please, you know, modify these so they're not as restrictive as you've set them up now. All right, so that's enough of that. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is sort of developments in the field. There's a tremendous amount of engineering effort going on around drones. And one of the things that really kind of leads this industry is every drone is built on what I'll call commodity parts. Even though that DJI and Unique and other companies and GoPro are going to do the software development around their drones to introduce features like follow me and circle and crash avoidance, all the sensors and the brains behind it, most for the most part the power supplies that, that power these drones are bought from other companies. They're customized for that drone and then they're put together much like a Heath kit where they assemble it. 
<clears throat> one of those companies behind the development of what I consider to be the brains of the drone is Intel. Intel builds specify, uh, specific processors for different type of applications. They've been working on a processor for drones for quite some time. It's actually being used in a lot of the drones we fly today as one of the components that uh, controls the guidance and the GPS and sort of the stabilization control. Well, this week um, Intel released their own drone, which is a commercial version of the drone called the Intel Falcon 8 Plus. Now, the original drone was the, the Intel Falcon 8, which was released in, I think it was in Europe and Australia, for surveillance of large swaths of land and for power line inspections and things like that. They've now released a version that's uh, live in the States. Why I think that's interesting is that uh, any technology that they're going to want to develop, they're going to have to test on a platform. Now they have their own platform to test it on, which means I think their processors are going to get more specific for drones. They're going to get cheaper. They're going to be more mass produced because they realize drones are exploding. So I think this is all good for us. I think the more Intel understands what drones need, the better their processors are going to be able to handle the complex calculations required with drones flying and the feature sets that are built in, which kind of frees up companies like DJI and Unique and GoPro to develop the software and build extra features into it much quicker. So I think it's a really good thing for us. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but I have a link below to that, and there's a picture of it up here you can look at as well. All right, the last thing I want to talk about, and I'm kind of getting on a soapbox here, so I apologize if, if this is offensive. I hope it isn't. Um, is I fly a lot of different brands of drone, a lot of different brands of drone, from the very small micro drones all the way up through the insanely expensive, you know, large copters that, that are out there. Um, and I, I do have a favorite. I like DJI a lot. I feel like they're ahead of the curve on a lot of things. I love that they're out in front with features that nobody else has really done yet and other people are catching up. But having said that, I'm a big fan of competition for so many different reasons. I feel like if you're the king, and no one's challenging you, there's no reason to keep innovating, right? So it's always kind of good to have somebody nipping at your heels to drive you forward from an innovation perspective. So when I hear that Unique has got a new product coming out or I have a brand new company like GoPro entering the market space, I applaud that. I think that that is a healthy thing for everybody because it's going to force prices to drop because now there's competition for pricing. It's going to force features to be advanced quicker than they would be normally if there's no competition. So I guess what I'm getting at is I talked about a Karma a couple of weeks ago in one of these vlogs. I also did a little clip preliminarily on it because it isn't out yet, and I've got one coming, so I'll do more clips on it when it comes. But I was surprised at the amount of venom directed at that company. I, I was totally surprised by how many people came out sort of hard against Karma, saying it's late to market, it's not as sophisticated, you know, it's dead on arrival. I, I just don't understand that. I mean, I understand completely that you've got a favorite drone and you know, you're know you kind of rooting for your home team and anybody else comes out, you compare them to your home team and say, oh, they're not as smart, they're not as fast. But I think that the Karma product deserves a little bit of breathing room. I feel like GoPro's first entry into the market space, as I said in the clip earlier, I don't think they entered the market to be the king of the hill. I don't think they came in there with guns ablaze and saying, look out DJI and Unique, we're taking you out. I think what they did instead was they sat back and said, we've developed this, this wonderful system, love it or hate it, this wonderful system for action cameras. They're king of the hill there. They're 70, 80 percent of the market space. And I know Canon makes them. I know that, you know, we've got companies like uh, Kodak in it and Sony's got one. And, and you can have that fist fight about whose camera's better. But what I like from a company perspective from the GoPro people is that they've looked at that ecosystem of cameras and said, our users have found the most creative, inventive ways to mount these cameras on every device out there and capture some amazing footage that we would have never gotten before because they didn't have waterproof cameras, they weren't durable. So let's help them expand that universe. Let's give them a way to put that camera in a drone that's integrated, that they can see through the controller. And I know you can say, well, you could have strapped it to a drone years before, and that's nothing new. It is kind of new because it's integrated to the drone. So they're seeing a video feed. They've got control over the gimbal movements now in the drone through the camera. So there, there's a lot of innovative things there. I also think, you know, and I've said this before, and I know this is the one thing I keep beating DJI up on, is they've got that removable camera, which, again, if you think about it from an ecosystem perspective, they've developed an entire system of ways to use that GoPro camera. So the drone is one way to get it up in the air and catch those action shots when you're when you're moving around outdoors. You also can remove the gimbal, put it in the Karma stick and use that as a stabilized camera mount. So if they didn't release the drone and just release that gimbal with the Karma stick, what a cool accessory that would be. Everybody would have been a fan of that. They would have said, oh my gosh, they're giving you a, a build-it-yourself Osmo for less money. This is brilliant. But the fact that they also released a drone that that Karma stick gimbal fits into 
I think is, you know, is something that should be applauded. So, and I know this is very personal and it's very opinion based, but I would just say for all of us, uh, as much as we love our particular products, let's give these guys a little bit of breathing room because the worst thing that could happen is if the public opinion gets so strong against that before it hits the street and those sales plummet, that's one less competitor out there to keep DJI and unique moving forward. So I think there's a market space for it and I've gone on record of saying, I think they've got a built in market space with their own customers to buy that Karma in mass. But I also think it's the kind of drone that a lot of people that are on the fence, I've got a cousin, I've got an uncle, I've got a father who's thinking, I want to get into droning, but I just don't want to deal with all that DJI controller and cables and external monitors and all that kind of stuff. That Karma seems like the perfect little suitcase that I can take with me, fly it you know, around me, close to me, not very far away, but around me and close to me, and I can enjoy the experience. And I don't have to deal with all the technology around the drone. So, you know, I think that'll draw people that aren't into droning into the hobby as well, which, again, is good for all of us, right? Because it's a larger body of people we can drone with, we can fly with, and we can have friends, and, and the community just grows stronger by having that. So, anyway, that's all I wanted to say at the end of this, but I, if we could all take a step back from it for a couple of weeks, let the thing hit the market, let's see what kind of sales figures come out. And even still, I love that competition. So, just my two cents on it. Don't Please don't flame me below if you're a big fan of DJI. I'm not saying it's not a good drone. I think I've been pretty clear that I think everybody deserves a seat at the table. Anyway, that's my two cents for the week. Um, hopefully you guys find this useful. So far, the, the traffic has been really good on the vlog, so I'm going to continue to do them. There's just a lot of really good information coming out around this technology and around these new innovations that I'll continue to update you with as I can. I will do separate clips on, I'll do another clip on the Karma. I'll do probably an intro clip on these just to give you a little better understanding of it. I'm going to try and do a live cast with my friend Jack Strones from Europe to uh, try and give you more insight into what's going on with that UK regulations. Might be interesting to tune in on that. Anyway, that's it for this week. So thanks again for watching. Hope you guys are uh, having fun watching these and you're out there droning today and you'll watch this when you get home later tonight. Thanks again. See you soon. Mm -hmm.